Right. This is a sort of nursery rhyme in a way. Um, I just want to look at what was going on in Britain. Um, and it, it is not quite Britain. It's probably just England um, because that's all we knew about in the 70s. We knew there was a flying Frenchman, um, but really we were pretty isolated. We may have heard of Europe, um, but it's all about what was going on really in in England at that time. Um, when we had two professional aerial photography type people, St. Joseph on the left with his F24 cameras and John Hampton on the right um, with all the junk that he used to fly with. Um, and yes, yeah, St. Joseph they had his own empire. John worked for the Royal Commission on Historical Monuments then, for whom I later worked, and also Cathy, um, just to complete the circle. Um, but there were also, from the mid-70s, there were, there were loads and loads of aerial photographers, um, because in those days, things were a bit easier, and anybody could go to an airfield, persuade a pilot to take them flying, and lean out the window and take photographs. And they did. And by the the mid seventies, there were probably about forty odd people taking aerial photographs. Um, they were odd people too, um, and just dumping them in archives because that's what they did, and probably making slideshows of them. Um, it was in the days when high resolution satellites were like this. Um, I bought this one about nineteen. 75, I suppose it was my bit of Wessex um, and the perceptive among you might recognize Heathrow there if you can see my mouse and then we've got Reading and we've got Swindon Bristol Southampton's down there there's the Isle of Wight and I was looking at a bit round there um, you could actually follow this satellite image if you've got a one to 25,000 map, which shows individual fields and a magnifying glass and really wanted to go mad. Um, you could track yourself from field to field. Um, but that was as good as we had with satellites. Um, in the early 70s, there was this rescue trust was, was founded um, because archaeologists realised that there was a lot of damage being done by mainly development, which is, in those days, it was probably more quarrying than anything else. Um, so that was an active thing going on in the background. Um, and we also had the publication of this, which coincided with the, the beginning of the Sites and Monuments records, which started, um, I think this Oxford one was was one of the first ones, sort of early early seventies, but most of them happened in about seventy six, when each county in England had its own archaeological component. It, it varied enormously, but one of the things they needed to do was find out what archaeological sites were in their patch, so that they could um, react to any development proposals. Um, and this book was one of them. This came at just the right time um, when people were beginning to wonder um, what we could do with all the aerial stuff. They had pages inside it of prop marks, um, which they then described in one kilometre boxes. So that area was described as something like um, intense activity um, bounded by the River Thames, the River Thame, and an earthwork, um, and that was about it. Um, but it gave it gave them a clue. Um, whereas if you had development in that square, um, or you'd have what, what two ring ditches and a right angle, maybe, um, and a wind pump. Um, but that was the beginning of the sites and monuments records. Um, there had been mapping before. There's this this one, which um, in Britain was famous anyway, um, that the Royal Commission did, um, mainly looking again at what was being destroyed by gravel, um, with fairly the elementary mapping in that. Um, Webster and Hobley have published a, 
a survey in the, I think it was in one of the archaeological journals, um, of what they had found on mainly Jim Pickering and Arnold Baker's photos. They were two of the um, private flyers, as we used to call them then. Um, but again, it's a gravel landscape, so there's quite a lot visible on it. Um, and this Fenland in Roman times, which was a project that was started before the Second World War and finished and published in 1970, looking at Fenland archaeology. Um, and again, they did lots of mapping that was published at once at 25,000. Um, so we had lots of mapping had been done, or not lots, some. We knew about maps. This is part of the Cambridge Sites and Monuments record. They had a what they called the air photo overlay, um, which on this is covered in ridge and furrow. And I did an MSC scheme, that's manpower service, it's not a degree, um, in 1983-4. to And we were having sometimes to rub out the ridge and furrow to draw the, the crop marks site that had become visible since the Ridge and Furrow was leveled because there was a there were subsidies to do that in the 60s. Um, so the sites and monuments records were building up their their maps of what was going on, by which I mean from the air photos. Um, Derek Riley had retired from work, um, got his flying license again and started flying around in a part of the country which had been ignored. I think St. Joseph had been over it a couple of times, taken two or three photographs, but for some reason Derek thought it was going to be good, um, and it was. And he flew for several years um, and did mapping. Um, and you've got the, the, the area maps, let's say, in which he's also marking villages and woods and places where you will not see archaeology. Um, and I think these negative zones are quite an important part of the mapping. Um, so he had his area maps and he was looking at what he called brickwork field systems. And then he had the more detailed maps where he, he became aware of relationships between small enclosures and fields and various other things. Um, and at about the same time, I was doing my non-PhD in this chunk of Wessex. Um, that's where the satellite photograph showed um, that bit. Um, I wanted to look at the air photos in that area, um, take a fairly large area and just see whether there were similarities or changes. Um, and because it was the 70s, I was sort of trendy. Um, classified things by shape, by the way that the the entrances were made silly buggers with graphs and um, so on, and tried to make tried to make sense of it in that way, um, by what we we called classification in those days, it might still be called that. Um, and that sort of led to Danbury, um, because I met Cunliffe at a party one day. Um, and the Danbury area was 10% of my non-PhD area. Um, and that was worked up and published in whenever it was, 84. Um, and at the same time, the Royal Commission were building up the staff numbers and, and have, having or making time to do mapping, um, of which Cathy's Yorkshire World's book was one of them. Um, but that's way after... I'm talking about. Um, but they were again doing fairly small areas and John was fanatical, John Hampton, about mapping every tiny detail that you could. So over here you got all the knobbly bits of ditches, which may or may not be important, but you'll map them in case they are, um, which is a good way of doing things if you've got the time to do it. Um, and around about the same time, this is okay, 1980, it says in the letter, Paul Ashby, who was better known as a, a Barrows man, he published a book on long barrows and round barrows, he wrote to David Wilson suggesting the need for a seminar. Now, Ashby 
really had nothing to do with aerial photographs, but he was a member of the committee for aerial photography in Cambridge. So he would have been aware of it, um, of what was going on and what was not going on from that. Um, his letter and the papers that went with it really are quite a nice review, I suppose, of what wasn't going on and what needed to go on. Um, but he suggested a meeting to, to David Wilson um, and David then, this is this is almost the only picture I've got of David, that's him. Um, he got a seminar going, note that it was called a seminar, um, with invited people and he wanted to keep it to under 15. Um, and these were people who were known to David, um, not necessarily very aerial people. Um, the Brits might recognise some of the names and think, what the hell was he doing there? Um, but there was a meeting. Um, and what comes next? There it was. Um, Wilson College, Cambridge, somewhere in there. Um, and that was the agenda programme, if you like, with me scribbling who was doing what against it. So it was, it wasn't very adventurous. It was people saying what, what they knew about, I suppose. Um, but at the end of that, um, it was suggested that maybe a, maybe a meeting of specialists would be a good idea. Um, and Rowan Webster, who will appear later, was also working at QCAP. And he was, any time anybody came in to look at the collection, he would scuttle out and ask them what they were doing. And if it was archaeological, he'd, he'd write their name down. And so the, the list of participants at the second meeting, this lot, were much more involved with aerial things than the first one. And we got uh, Bewley, Jill Collins... Um, Leslie McKinnis, they were doing PhDs at the time, which included sort of aerial survey components. Um, we've got, yeah, Graham Soap, who was John Hampton's, I suppose, oldest member of staff by then, came along. Um, but these were people involved with it. Richard Hingley, who then went on to look at Roman somewhere, um, he was mapping for a county, I think, at the time but yeah much more closely involved people um so we had some case studies and then looked at what to do with all of this stuff um and then as a result of that rowan and david wilson got the idea to name the group um and they said to me before they told me about it they said we've got this group going you're gonna hate the name um which was right um, and that was really the first meeting then, and I think Cass is doing this, so I'm not going to put too much in, um, but it was in the QCAT building, which was at the time guarded by this rather nice crocodile. Um, and if you just glance at the program on the left, you'll see that it's very different to what we have now. Um, the small workshops. We we were these were people that were actually dealing with things. Um, I think it was very different then. Um, we had our problems and we solved some of them. We solved how to map mainly because computers had come along um, and mapping conventions, which I remember Chris Musson saying used to drive him mad when all we talked about was mapping conventions. Um, classification, we've got much more relaxed with, I suppose. Um, we began to understand, I think, what was going on in the past, um, but we never trained the aerial photographers to produce what we wanted. Um, and I'm going to throw this in because there wasn't all that much about the future that I could see. And it really, it comes down to one word, um, which isn't here. Um, but we're used to all this stuff. We're used to Aerial photos, we've got these drone auto photos, we've got visualizations, we've got these horrible 3D models. Um, and that's often seen as the end story. Um, I think that's all wrong. Um, 
I'm really the word that I'm looking for is interpretation. Um, and those of you who talk anything to do with aerial photos will know that getting people to draw over the pictures, um, usually on a plastic overlay so that you can see what's underneath, is a really good way of concentrating your mind on what you're seeing. But I think the purpose of what we're doing, we need to explain what we're seeing on the photographs to other people. So we look at the photos, we draw lines on them digitally now, um, and we make maps. And really, it's this interpretation which needs to come back. Um, and it has gone away, I think. So it would be nice in this this chapter of the, the LIDAR book that Rebecca mentioned, it would be really nice if there was a chapter on interpreting the stuff at the end, or maybe even at the beginning. Um, so we could have another school to do that, couldn't we? I've sort of a name for it. Um, some people might um, <laughs> see the point of that. <laughs> okay, thank you, Chris. Um, and then that's it. We can go off into the sunrise, as this was now. And that's that's me done. Thank you. <laughs>